Good morning, third grade. Today is Thursday, April 30th, 2020. We are going to continue working on poetry just like we started last week. And we're actually going to be working on five pages. It'll be a little different than last week because most of these pages we're just going to be discussing them. Although there are a couple pages where you will be doing some identifying. And so if you want to pause the video now and go get a highlighter if you have one and a pencil along with your student interactive, that will be helpful. So feel free to do that now. We're going to begin on page 497. The title of this page is Composing Like a Poet. So what does it mean to compose? When you compose something, you are creating it. So what does it mean to create poetry like a poet would? When poets write, they have plenty of tools to use. Poetic language allows poets to turn ordinary words into something special. It allows readers to see the world in new and different ways. Poetic language includes vivid imagery, musical qualities, and unusual comparisons. So that means you might be comparing things that you wouldn't normally compare. There might be musical qualities like rhythm, rhyme, and beat that you hear when you read the poem. And that vivid imagery, lots of details, lots of descriptive words and adjectives. It says to read the poem about a tree. Notice how the poet uses poetic language to describe this ordinary object. All right, I'm gonna zoom in on this for you and let's go ahead and read. It says, my friend, mighty oak tree, unafraid, you give me peace, you give me shade. Your limbs stretch upward to the sky. You make me gaze and wonder why. Bright green branches slowly sway. We wave goodbye to this great day. So in blue, this box tells us that the words mighty and unafraid, which are highlighted in yellow in the first line, and bright green on the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth line, they are descriptive words that help me imagine the tree. The words stretch and sway and wave describe the movements a person could make. These verbs make the tree seem like a person. Whenever we make something non-living seem like it is living, we're like doing something, an action that a person could do, that's called personification. So the author of this poem personified the tree because a tree can't really wave, a tree can't really sway or stretch the way a person would. But when we use that language, we're personifying the tree. Last but not least, this gray box says the rhyming words, unafraid and shade, sky and why, and sway and day, add that rhythm or musical quality to the description. Now on all of the pages we're going to look at today, it will tell you to turn to your writing notebook or any piece of paper you have and compose a poem or create a poem about an ordinary object. This is optional. I am not requiring you to do any writing this week. I just want you to look through these pages and start to understand these different, different poem elements. However, you're more than welcome to create a poem if you would like to, and I'd be happy to read it. Let's move on to the next page. The next page we'll be looking at is page 498, page 498. And the title of this page is to compose with imagery. So now we're really focusing on imagery, those vivid details. Imagery is the use of words that help the reader experience sensory details. So those are those five senses that we have. Our taste, sight, sound, smell, and feel or touch. Poets use imagery to create a picture in a reader's mind. So here are some examples. Something could taste salty or spicy. You could see something that looks bright. It could be easy to see if it was bright. Or foggy, maybe it's hard to see, you can barely see it. A sound, something could be quiet or someone or something, maybe a lion could be roaring. Something could smell smoky or fresh or clean. Something could feel silky or slimy. Again, like I said before, you don't have to create your own poem, but you're welcome to. It's a really good idea to think about the five senses when you're creating your poem, because if you're the author, your goal is for the reader to feel something. Um, and you could give them a sense of what you're hearing or smelling or tasting or touching. Let's go ahead and move on to the next page. This page is about composing with rhyme and with rhythm. Poetry has characteristics that make it different from other forms of writing. Poets use elements of craft, such as rhythm and rhyme, when they compose poems. Rhythm is the pattern of sounds in speech or writing. Just like a song has a beat, a poem can have a beat or a rhythm. So you guys, that's basically what it is. I might read a poem 
with a little bit of a different beat than you read a poem. We might read it the same way, but however it's being read, that beat of the poem is the rhythm. Let's talk about rhyme. You're probably familiar with this. It's a skill I know you already know, but rhyme, it says rhyme is two or more words that have the same ending sound. Many poems use rhyme at the end of lines, but you guys, do all poems have to have rhyming words? No, they don't, that's the poet's choice. But here are some examples, bag and rag. Both of these sounds have the ag sound made by the ag. Frog and dog, both of these words have the og sound made by og. It says to read the poem several times. When you hear the rhythm, read the poem aloud and clap your hands to the rhythm. So for example, this poem is called The Farmer's Market. Let's read it once together, and then let's see if we can do the clap activity. The Farmer's Market. Bright orange pumpkins lined up in a row. Crunchy green vegetables, the sun makes them grow. Bright red tomatoes, some fresh homemade bread. My mouth starts to water. Let's buy jelly spread. Okay, so I already see some rhyming words. I see pumpkins, and hmm, does that rhyme with vegetables? No, but I see row, and that rhymes with grow. So you're going to notice that in both of these stanzas, we talked about this last week too. We had a really similar example or a similar poem structure. Um, but in both of these stanzas, you'll notice that the last word in the second line and the last word in the fourth line rhyme. So for example, row and grow, bread and spread. All right, so the direction said to read the poem aloud and clap your hands to the rhythm. Bright orange pumpkins lined up in a row. Crunchy green vegetables, the sun makes them grow. Bright red tomatoes, some fresh homemade bread. My mouth starts to water, let's buy jelly spread. So that's what I hear. You might hear this in a different way. Now it says to write the pairs of words that rhyme in the poem. We already talked about that. So the word pairs are row and grow and bread and spread. Refer to the text for spelling. Again, you do not have to compose a poem, but you are more than welcome to. When you do write poetry, you should be thinking about, do I want to include rhyme? And what's the rhythm of this poem? All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about alliteration. And on this page, if you're following along with me, you will want to get a highlighter ready and have a pencil as well. So alliteration is a tool that poets use to express sounds in words. Alliteration is the repetition of a consonant sound or letter at the beginning of words. Tongue twisters have alliteration. So for example, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. If you say that over and over, it's a tongue twister. Sometimes it's tricky to say, especially the faster you go. But you'll notice that all of the words, almost all of the words in that sentence start with the letter P and the same sound. Poets also use alliteration to create a mood. For example, words that begin with the letter L or M may create a peaceful mood, like long days, lazy nights, lullabies about love. Gives you a sense of peace when you read that. Now, onomatopoeia is really fun. These are words that sound like what they mean. It's a sound device tool that poets use to help readers experience a poem, like hiss. It's the word, but it's also the sound. Maybe a snake is making that sound. Sizzle, maybe something sizzling on the stovetop when you or your family members are cooking. Clickety clack, I don't know, maybe it's a horse trotting along and the hooves are going clickety clack. So your job is to read the poem, this poem is called The Bee, and it says to highlight the words that show alliteration and underline the words that show onomatopoeia. So let's read it once, and then we'll go back and highlight and underline together. The Bee. Busy bee, you buzz all day, pollinating plants on the prairie path. Humming, buzzing, zipping by, hiding honey in your hive. So when I read, busy bee, you buzz all day, I'm going to highlight busy and bee and buzz because those words show alliteration. They all start with that bee sound. And I'm going to underline the word buzz because buzz is the word, but it's also a sound word. That's onomatopoeia. When I reread that next line, pollinating plants on the prairie path, all of the words that start with the letter P, pollinating plants, prairie and path, I will highlight because those words show alliteration. This line does not contain any onomatopoeia, so you have nothing to underline. What about the next line? Humming, 
buzzing, zipping by. You are going to underline humming, buzzing, and zipping because those three words are onomatopoeia. They show onomatopoeia. Hiding honey in your hive. You would go ahead and highlight hiding honey and hive. All right, let's move on. We are on to our last page, page 501. And this is all about figurative language. You are going to need your highlighter on this page as well and your pencil. Compose with figurative language. Figurative language gives words a meaning beyond their dictionary definition. So we're going to be looking for similes and metaphors. Let's talk about what these both mean. A simile compares two unlike things or different things that are alike in at least one way using the comparison like or as. The example is the children ran like the wind. So you're comparing the children to the wind. They probably were running pretty quickly or maybe swiftly. Meaning, the simile compares the speed of the children running to the wind. A metaphor. A metaphor is a comparison between two unlike things that are alike in at least one way without using any words of comparison. So, Remember we talked about a simile compares with the words like or as. A metaphor compares with the word is. Happiness is iced tea on a summer day. The metaphor compares the quality of happiness to the joy of sipping iced tea. So whoever wrote that metaphor really enjoys the summertime and maybe having um, that cool iced tea on a hot summer day makes them happy. All right, your job is to read the poem, highlight the similes, and underline the metaphor. Let's read. It says, my dog is hunting like a panther in the forest. She lowers her body, one paw placed slowly in front of the other. She sneaks around the corner like a thief in the night. Her eyes are yellow moons lighting her path. Without notice, she sprints toward the tree, fast as lightning. So remember, you are going to highlight the similes and underline the metaphors. So my dog is hunting like a panther in the forest. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that, okay? There's a comparison in there with the word like. And remember, if I scroll up, I know that when I compare with the word like, it's a simile, so you're going to highlight that. She lowers her body, one paw placed slowly in front of the other. Nope, that doesn't contain any metaphors or similes. What about the next sentence? She sneaks around the corner like a thief in the night. Again, you are going to highlight that sentence because I see the word like. We're comparing how someone is sneaking around the corner like a thief, maybe quietly or mischievously. Go ahead and highlight that. Her eyes are yellow moons lighting her path. Now, this is an interesting one. You are going to underline her eyes are yellow moons. Now, even though we didn't use the word is to compare her eyes to the moons, we are still comparing them, okay? So we know it's a metaphor. Remember, a metaphor compares two things that are similar in some way, but they're different things. And you don't have to use a comparing word. Her eyes are yellow moons lighting her path. All right, let's go ahead and read the last sentence. Without notice, she sprints towards the tree fast as lightning. You are going to highlight without notice, she sprints towards the tree fast as lightning. My comparing word is as. So again, I know that that's a simile, fast as lightning. All right, so remember you're welcome to create your own poems. If you want to send them to me, go for it. You do not have to. It is not a requirement this week. I just really want you to understand these different elements of poetry that authors or poets use to create their works of poetry. Please reach out to me if you need me. We'll have our meeting tomorrow together on Zoom. If you can't find that invitation, look through your email or contact me. Tomorrow, your job is also to take your Unit 5 Week 2 progress check and make sure you have submitted your Studies Weekly test for Week 25. American labor. Please reach out if you need me and I'll see you tomorrow.